<laughs> All right, well, this comes uh, from book 10. It is not the beginning of the book, though you might think so to begin with. There's a certain amount of other stuff that happens before this. But uh, this is where you may remember, those of you who have read book nine, and I assume most of you have, that it ended with uh, uh, Jamie's illegitimate son, William, coming to his door to ask him for help in rescuing Lord John. It, Willie's adoptive father and uh, uh, very dear to him, who has been uh, kidnapped and uh, is being held on shipboard somewhere. They don't, don't know, he doesn't know where. He doesn't have anyone else who could possibly help him. So in spite of the fact that he deeply resents being, as he puts it, the gat of a Scottish criminal, and, <laughs> and also deplores having been lied to for his entire life, and therefore not all that fond of Mr. Fraser, or his father, other father at the moment, he still really wants to rescue Lord John, and Jamie Fraser is probably the only one who can help him do it. So anyway, at this point, which is after a certain uh, number of other things happened, they're uh, ready to leave on their quest. Rather to William's surprise, Fraser appeared for departure clad in a faded plaid with a ragged edge. This worn with a hunting shirt shadowed with ancient bloodstains, and a belt from which depended an assortment of weaponry, and a small goatskin bag whose purpose was a mystery. Homespun stockings and a cartridge box hung from a strap over his shoulder completed the ensemble. Camouflage, Fraser said with a shrug, answering William's look. What? Oh. Fraser was evidently taken aback for a moment, and his face reflected an extraordinarily rapid series of uninterpretable thoughts. It's uh, from the French, I think. Camoufle? You can that one? I don't know. What does it mean? Ah, well, camoufle is a whiff of smoke that you blow in someone's face. Camouflage just means you want folk not to notice what you are or ask what you're up to. And that is camouflage, is it? William asked skeptically, gesturing at Fraser's kilt. You look like a bandit. Fraser smiled. Aye. And what would you do if you met a bandit on the road? Stop and ask him his business? <laughs> I take your point. As he spoke the words, he had a sudden odd qualm and a coldness down his jaw. Fraser's smile changed to a look of mild concern. What is it, lad? Are you taking queer? Aye. No, William said abruptly, I'm fine. And what, may I ask, am I meant to be if you're taken for a bandit? Your accomplice? If necessary, Fraser said. But I suppose you could be my prisoner in case of need. There's a bit of rope in my saddlebags. <laughs> Jesus, William muttered, and Fraser laughed. The man was in bloody high spirits for someone snatched away from hearth and home to go off on what anyone might legitimately call a crack-brained venture. On the other hand, he reflected, maybe he's glad to get away from his tenants. Mother Claire appeared at this point with several packages in her arms, and Francis behind her, similarly burdened. Food for the day, Mother Claire said, handing her husband a cloth bag that smelled pleasantly of cheese, cold meat, and dried fruit. Food for tomorrow, and she handed William a similar bag. And after that, you're on your own, you're on your own for nourishment. What's this, William asked as she handed him a cloth-wrapped bundle that didn't smell of food. Bandages, she replied succinctly, and handed him a small wooden box and medicines for diarrhea and constipation. <laughs> ah, I'm sure those will be helpful, he said, gingerly stuffing the medical items in his haversack. I really hope not, she said, giving him a bleak look, but I've known your father far too long to have illusions. <laughs> <laughs> what about drink, Fraser interrupted, with what even William could see was mock innocence. Just here, Francis said with modest triumph, and handed over two similar bags, these clinking and sloshing as they moved. She met William's eye with a tranquil face. No trace of what had happened in the stable half an hour before. No, I'm not telling you. <laughs> the poem fluttered through him once again, but this time he knew what it was. Jane, standing just behind his shoulder. I take your point, he'd said to her once. Well, that's a novelty, she replied. It's usually the other way round. <laughs> Goodbye, Francis, he said abruptly, and turned to mount his horse, consciously not looking as Fraser took farewell of his wife. The weather was fine, the horses comfortable in their skins, and the sense of movement at last was a relief to William's chafing spirit. It agreed that Savannah must be their first destination, and he was eager for it. There was a packet of letters in one of his saddlebags, carefully composed and meant to be delivered to those friends of his in the army, who could be trusted at least not to mock or ignore him, each inquiring whether the correspondent might have knowledge of Captain Elliot Richardson, the palace, or Captain Dennis Randall. He hoped urgently that Uncle Hal had returned to Savannah, that he longed to see the house again, even if his uncle wasn't in it. It was the closest place he'd had to a home in the last year or so, and he felt obscurely that he might feel more settled in his mind, close to familiar things and people, even if only for a short while. And he knew people who in Savannah who weren't in the army too. 
It was to make their rounds seeking information while Fraser scoured the docks and questioned various of the sea captains he'd met when working in Savannah a few years ago. They paused at noon to eat a little of their food and let the horses crop grass. They ate mostly in silence, each alone with thoughts of the journey and its hoped for end. William was trying to suppress the part of his mind that hoped against hope to find the palace in Savannah at anchor. If so, well, they'd storm aboard and demand Lord John's immediate liberty, threaten to cut Richardson's throat, probably with his own neckcloth, maybe. He touched the reassuring weight of the long-handled Highland pistol in his belt, suitable, as Fraser had told him, for use as either firearm or club. Right preserve us, Fraser said suddenly, and stood up, jerking William out of a pleasant daydream of beating Richardson's brains out. <laughs> the man on the mule was coming toward them, though in no particular hurry about it. He'd seen them, though, and lifted a hand in greeting. Fraser said something under his breath in Gaelic that didn't sound entirely pleased, but showed the crumbs on his plaid and walked down to the road. William followed, curious. The gentleman, if that was the word, on the mule brought his mount to an easy stop and beamed at Fraser. He was an Indian and dressed in that fashion, buckskin trousers and boots with a warm pink, cal pink calico shirt, a white cuff of shiny brass about his upper arm, and an assortment of necklaces and small brooches that winked and sparkled in the sunlight. His gray hair was bound up with string and a single black feather, and his dark eyes were bright with interest in the creases of his face. Well, that, Kamawakakawara, Fraser said, smiling. My sister said he'd come back when the war ended. Has it done so then? <coughs> the Indian gentleman tilted his head as though considering the question, but his eyes rested on William. My war has ended, yes, he said, and nodded cordially at William, but I believe that yours has just begun. Fraser made a Scottish noise in his throat and waved a hand toward the saddlebag on the ground and the half-gnawed chunk of journey cake beside it. Will you eat with us? Thank you, no. Your sister will feed me. Fraser muttered something else under his breath in Gaelic and crossed himself. The Indian laughed. My pardon, Fraser said with a brief bow, brief bow toward the Indian and a nod to William. This is my son, William. William, this is not Kanakakawara. Erstwhile Satchum to the people of Joseph Brandt, whom you may know. I have indeed heard of the gentleman, William said, and bowed respectfully, wondering what the hell a Satchum was and why he should have relations of whatever nature with Fraser's sister, who was a kind but redoubtable woman. You're welcome at the ridge, Fraser said, and one side of his mouth turned up, but I suppose you can that already. I came in hope that this would be the case, the Satchum said, and grinned, showing a number of teeth in good condition. I hope also to be of use to you in your absence, of these say. Fraser stiffened slightly at that, and the Indian noticed. I have heard the wolf's brother is injured, Satchum said, his face now serious. Does your wife say that he will mend? She does, God be thanked, but it will take some time. The Satchum nodded. Who will take your place at the fire while you are gone then? My daughter's man, Roger. You can him? The priest, oh yes, I know him. The Indian rose slightly in his stirrups, looking up the road toward the invisible settlement above, hidden in cloud and forest. He looked for a long moment, nodded his head, and sat back in the saddle. I will do what he cannot, nine fingers, he said to Fraser. Go to her war with a calm heart. And with a brief nod to William, he nudged his mule into motion and rode slowly away. Fraser watched him go, then beckoned William back to finish their meal, which they did in silence. William had questions, lots of them, but he could see that Fraser wanted to think. What did the um, Satchum mean? William asked carefully a little later as they turned out onto the road. What can he do that the Reverend Mackenzie can't? Fraser gave him a brief look, as though considering whether to say something, but then lifted one shoulder and said it. <laughs> Kill people, he said, without finding it too much. <laughs>